Hey, you guys are being re you're being recorded right now. So we're about to do a session with Kim, Stacy, Michelle, Ingrid, and I'll be a I'll be a chair filler over here. <laughs> All right, Hector, um, you talk about kind of um, turning ordinary conversations into value-added conversations. And when we were chatting before this, um, one thing that really resonated, I think, is going to resonate with everyone else out here. You come to a conference like QuickBooks Connect. You sit through session after session. You are you walk out like a saturated sponge, kind of leaking your way to the airport home. <laughs> and, uh, all these great ideas. I call it kind of the mountaintop experience, right? Where you're so excited, and then you go home, and what happens? You see the pile of work on your desk, and you jump right back into everything that you left behind a week ago, and none of those things actually come to fruition. So tell us a little bit about kind of some low hanging fruit opportunities that you see in your own practice where you can take just a ordinary, everyday conversation and kind of immediately flip that into a value-added conversation. Sure. I'll first unpack a little bit what you said about coming to conferences and stuff. So there's 430,000 CPAs in the United States, 865,000 uh, tax preparers in front of the IRS. There's 2,000 accountants in this place. This should make you feel like the cream of the crop. And you have to walk tall and you have to feel that. Because just being here is not just a monetary commitment, it's an emotional commitment. You know, we come to these things and we're bombarded with new information. And in some cases, we're inspired to think differently. And when we walk out of a session challenging our, our status quo, it, it makes us feel different. So we need, to, we need to bring that home and be intentional about doing something about it. Just the mere fact that you, you know, visited 20 app developers or 30 app developers is probably 19 or 29 more than what your competition has. So that, uh, that's a value-added conversation just to talk about the apps. But we're talking about turning uh, you know, a casual conversation to the value conversation. First thing I would tell you to do is just convert your whole persona to be about value. About value. Don't forget, value is subjective value is in the eye of the beholder. We value our time that we're working away from our family. Our clients value something else. They probably also value the same thing that we do. But if you're not talking about it, you, you can't discover. So you can ask questions like, one of the, my favorite questions to ask is, what's the last time you took a vacation? Hmm. Okay? And then when you took a vacation, did you leave the phone home? <laughs> I feel like it's did you, no. did, you, did you purposely pick a place that had broadband, that had internet, just in case you had to still connect with work? <laughs> and you, you know our clients. The, the reality is that they don't. Hey, I don't. Okay, I was just answering an email in between doing videos. Right? So when the client tells you, and, 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 and it's, it, it's an emotional issue, right? Not being able to take a vacation and disconnect. We all need vacation. So you tell the client, my goal is to help you take a real vacation. And that's it, that opens up the floodgates for value. Then you can talk about the technical stuff, you can talk about the timesheets, and you can talk about profits, and you can talk about financial statements, importing data, saving them time. But what truly is valuable is that, or for me, I really want to take a vacation and disconnect. Uh, so those are little things that maybe have nothing to do with industry challenges or competition or market share or headaches of converting desktop to QuickBooks Online, those little things, they open the floodgates. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about analytics. We should talk about analytics. We should talk about closing rate. We should talk about profits. We should talk about the technical stuff. That is the lake that we swim on. That's our expertise. We went to school for that, whether it's you know, formal school or school of life. The technical aspects of financial statements, that's our, that's our pride and joy. But the way you connect to the customer in a high level value is to talk about those little things. Awesome. Something like, sorry, <laughs> something like, um, you know, if, if they have kids, they're, they're going to go to college. Ask questions like, hey, do you have a college plan set up? Right? You're not there to help them get more profits. You're there to help them put their kids to the college they want to go to. So, you know, I get <laughs> I get emotional too. What are you comfortable with? Sorry, I help you. I get comfortable. I get emotional help you. I be your partner in that struggle. Those are the things that I value. So, um, 
I, I'm, a strange, I'm a strange hybrid because I talk about value pricing because I'm going through the journey of value pricing myself. But in the signature of my email, I have my what I call my first hour rate. It's called my first hour rate. It's not my hourly rate, it's my first hour rate. And I haven't figured out how to value price everything, but I can date you for $350, and, and then not, right, I can date you for $350, one hour, tell me your problem, I'll look at your QuickBooks file, I'll look at your Excel file, I'll, I'll review whatever you want me to review, we'll have a conversation about what you want, and then, then I can give you a fixed price, a value price. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in terms of fee structure in particular, so I'm going to say the standard, I, I strive for value pricing. But this, the, the pricing is the second step. The value is the first step. Okay? Value conversations are always strategically a mix between the questions, the, the, the cool questions, right? What are your profits? What are your ratios? And mix it in with the operations questions. You know, one of my favorite things to do and I work with a lot of uh, inventory clients, is walk the warehouse. Walk the warehouse and point and ask, hey, why is that box there? Right? And most accountants don't do that. I do that. Because it is quite possible that the owner doesn't know what that box is there. And they'll call the warehouse guy, and the guy goes, I don't know what the box is there. And we say, let's go open the box. And you open the box, and there's product there. Right? And then you go to the shelf, and there's no product on the shelf. That means that it is quite possible that at some point in the past week, someone tried to buy this from you. Maybe your QuickBooks says your inventory is right, but it, because it's sitting on a brown box, nobody knew. Right? Now, that comes from, I used to work in retail, I used to work in Best Buy, and I, they used to be really anal about product being available, right? Because no one can buy something that's not there. So I love walking the warehouse, and I think that's really where I add value. And when I go price and accounting service, people are okay with, with me doing a standard accounting service in which I reconcile the books and, and do the inventory. But that little tiny conversation where I walked the warehouse and we made a connection about something that had nothing to do with the core numbers, it was more of an operations issue, that's really where I had the value. So uh, my focus is, what, what is, is low-hanging fruit? Something that I can observe, that just doesn't seem right, that I can ask about it. Like you never want to say, you know, that brown box shouldn't be there. You never say that. But you can say, why is that box there? I, I'm just curious. Why is there a, 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 a box with a barcode there? Right? So you want to observe these little things in the operation and ask the question. Right? It has to be a question. You ask the question, and if, if, if they welcome the answer, if they're welcome to answer it, you'll discover some really interesting things. So then once you understand what's valuable to them, right? If, 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 if the boss or the owner got, gets really mad about that brown box being there, like if, if that interaction made a point, like if you were able to make a point there, then your conversation is not just about numbers. It's are you even running your business the way you're supposed to? Do you want me, you ask, do you want me to be involved with you in that way? Would you like us to do a monthly financial statement review and a warehouse walk? Right? And warehouse walks are, are awesome. And if you're doing these types of things, are you billing hourly for those warehouse walks? No. Or is it all fixed? No. Fixed? So, so there are situations where my client says, a, a, a new client, the lead, says, I need you to come here and I need to discuss with you whether I can hire you. And um, if I like the business, I say, yes, let's, let's do that. I'll go there. Two hours. I'll charge between five and six hundred dollars. And we'll do the combination of, of, of walking the business interviewing the employees. Believe it or not, the owner is not the most important person there. And the most important person is the, the, the holder of the paper. You know, you know how the client, or the guy, the last person that held the paper is the one that has the truth, but then it has to move to the next person that has to stamp it, and then it moves to the next person that makes a the photocopy on the pink paper, and then it moves to the next person that archives it, and then it moves to the next, and, and then once you... for that. Yeah. <laughs> I understand, but when, when you follow, the holder of the paper, you discover all these really weird inefficiencies. And you ask simple questions like, just curious, why does that paper need to move to seven different places for you to approve this transaction? And I guarantee you the answer is always, well, that's the way, it, that's the way it, it's always been done. Yes. Yes. And, then you, and, then, and then you talk to the business owner and you say, are, are, 
are we okay with this? Are, 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 is, is this the way you want to run your business? And, and they get this existential shock that says, okay, let's talk about this. And, and, and when, you, when you get there, right, that's, that's what I'm saying is, don't focus, if, you, if you're going to do, uh, move away from hourly pricing into value-based pricing, don't start with the price. Start with the value. And the price comes. <laughs> well, and you know, the other thing, the reason a lot of us don't want to raise our rates is we're afraid we're going to lose a client. Mm -hmm. You know what? Well, if if you raise, not going to Well, yeah, you're not going to want to. And if you're going to if you're going to raise your rates a little bit, you're going to lose that client anyway. Yeah. That's not a valuable client. We do not want to compete based on price. Right. We're not the Walmart low cost. There's always right. someone else who's willing to do it for less than us. So we don't want to worry about that. And if you raise your price, like she said, it's not the clients you want, and you were going to lose them anyway as soon as someone else cheaper came along. So bye bye, good riddance. Now you have time for better, more valuable clients for you. And then when they come back, and then they if come back, after charge you twice as much. You charge <laughs> twice as much as you would have in the first place. Yeah, yeah. One of my exactly. very favorite Ron Baker quotes of all time <laughs> is you want the clients that get on an airplane and turn left. Not the ones that bought their ticket on Priceline.com. And I heard that 10 years ago and I loved it because you want the clients that are willing to pay for the valuable experience of first class. Maybe you're not charging them a first class price, but you definitely can be charging them economy plus. You do not need to be charging them the you know last minute basement bottom line price. Because then again, they're not valuing valuing your services and they might as well go get it somewhere else. Can I add a counterpoint to uh, yes. yes, okay. Um, there are some clients that they're not bad, they turn bad. You know, you know what I mean? Just that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some, the clients are bad, bad. We know that from the get go. Right? Clients start good, they turn bad. I'm going to tell you something and look into this for yourself, something that, that I learned. Sometimes me underpricing turn them bad. Mm -hmm. Let me unpack that. Yeah. Because I underpriced, I didn't budget enough time to meet their expectations. So sometimes underpricing and underestimating what they want and what they value turns them bad. Look into yourself every time you fire a client. I understand that some are bad, some are pita. I get it. <laughs> but if, you, if you're a good person, and I assume everybody here is a good person, you, you, get a gut, <laughs> you get that gut feeling when you first take the client that is a, that, that is a bad client. If you took them anyway, okay, shame on yeah, you. Right. But but if the client was good and it turned bad, I'm telling you, it's likely yeah. that your bad pricing, which costs you not to invest enough in the client, turns them bad. That's what I learned anyway. Well, you know, one of the things too is sometimes we want to price low because, because, because. We may make excuses. Because I work from home, because I'm just getting started, because this is a new industry. Because I want to help them. Right? Yeah, yeah. And we we yeah. come up with reasons why right. we shouldn't charge as much as we're worth. And so we devalue ourselves, we charge too little. But if you think about it, in the eyes of a client, like if I want to call a plumber, and I call three different plumbers, what do you charge, what do you charge, and I get 75, 85, 95, and then I call Joe the plumber and he's 35. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. I'm not going to go with him. Right. So it, it, it's contrary to what we think. If you're charging too little, you're devaluing yourself yeah. in their eyes. Right. What's and, wrong with you? They're asking yeah, what's wrong. Yeah. What's wrong? Yeah. You know, what, what is wrong with this person because yeah. they're so cheap? So we need to be in the average ranges. We don't want to try to keep charging a lower and lower price. And like he said, if you don't price it right, you're not going to necessarily invest the time in the client. So I think that's a great point. No, and I, I love that. I want to actually pick up right there. You're not going to spend the right time with the client. So, Ingrid, when Polymath went through kind of the, the weeding of the garden and yeah. getting, got rid of all of the clients that were no longer the right fit for you, um, share with us what that did to your bottom line. And more importantly, even, that, I mean, money's great, right? We're all here because we want to yeah. have a living and support our families and all of that. But when you feel like you're making a difference with the clients that you do have and you're better serving them and all of that, tell me kind of, Tell us how that impacted your current clients that you did keep and what it did for your, your profitability. So it was October 2015. This is actually right after we got third place in the Intuit Firm of the Future contest. So we had just started value pricing and rolling out fixed price packages, value price packages with our clients. 
and I got back from the Books Connect and I realized, oh my gosh, we've got a lot of really crappy clients. <laughs> a lot of clients that aren't a fit. And at that point, two years ago, October 2015, we had 96 clients at Polymath. And I went through and I printed up a list of my clients and I highlighted all of the ones that me and my team were not excited to work with. And when I say excited, I mean love this client, raving fan, really enjoy working with them. And there were way too many. <laughs> and we fired 20% of our clients in a day. In a day, 20% gone. Wow, that was loud. <laughs> and we did most of it over email. There were a couple of phone calls, but for the most part, it's on email. If anyone would like to see a template of that email, it's in an article on the Firm of the Future website. You're welcome to it. And after that, we continued to let clients go. And the really surprising thing is that we didn't take on very many more clients really quickly. I mean, we always have a bit of marketing going on. We actually have a waiting list for new clients. But we don't take on that many new clients very quickly. What we did instead was we refocused our energy on the good clients, the ones who had been asking us for more, and we didn't have time to give it to them because we were too busy chasing down random tiny clients with their bloody bank statements, and they were never going to show up to their own ballgame. We finally said, you know what? This is how we do it here, and if you don't want to do it that way, that's fine. Perhaps we're not a fit. Let's refer you to somebody else who might be a better fit for you. And we redirected our energy onto the clients that we were really passionate about working with. And those clients were stoked to pay us more. Their response was, oh, thank heavens, this is what we've been waiting for. Yes, please double my price. I want your next level up package. I'm so glad you have packages now. Those are the clients that we want to be working with. And those are the clients that we started taking on to replace the clients that we were letting go of. And we got through 20% that first day, and then we started letting go more. We got, you know, 30, 40, and then 60%, we started noticing a little bit of a negative impact on our top line. But short story, over the course of six months after that October 2015, we doubled our revenue. And in the packet that goes along with this panel discussion, there's all kinds of great questions and things you can download and look over in case you, you know, want the Cliff's Notes versions of a lot of the cool stuff that we're saying up here. Um, it says in there that, you know, we went from 96 and today we have 34 clients. No, we did it again this past October, and that was since I sent my answers to him. Um, we now have 26 clients, and we're doing better than we ever have. And it's fantastic because we have deeper relationships with fewer clients, and they're the relationships that we really love to work with. Awesome. <coughs> okay, we're coming down to our final 10 minutes. I want to grab a couple audience questions, Stacy, for you. Um, there was two. Um, one is, how long do your quick reviews normally take, and what documents do you ask your clients for when you're about to, to bring the client on board and, and perform one? And then along those same lines. Wait, wait, wait let me do that one. Do that first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. My little brain will. <laughs> uh, so we ask for a quick book file. It's a quick review. It's not an in depth analysis, and we don't spend any more than two hours doing it. Awesome. Can, Love it. can I add one thing on that? Yeah. So hopefully, all of you are a pro advisor. If you're not, you should join because it's free. In module five, if you're. If you're in there, you go into the training um, materials, in the advanced certification training materials, module five, the second part of that is called troubleshooting, and it talks about how to go through and look at their balance sheet and income statement and look for things that look like a problem. Look for things where they may be doing the workflow incorrectly. For example, look at a deposit and funds registers. Think, are things going in and never back out? Look at sales taxes payable. Are things going in and never coming back out because they're paying for a wrong and things like that? So in the advanced certification materials, you have access to those even if you're not ready to work on the test. That's some great materials in there that you all have access to. So please go take a look at that. That can give you some, some help. Mm -hmm. Another great I'm going to correct you on something. Okay, please do. Don't join it because it's free. <laughs> That's a good it because it's valuable, it happens it is. to be free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Another yeah. resource similar to Stacy's um, fantastic quick review process, we put our clients through a discovery phase. 
And uh, if anyone wants to see our discovery phase checklist that we use at Polymath, it's available on our website. Feel free to dive in and use it. Oh. Yeah, we have a checklist that we go through, and then we provide them with the checklist uh, when we're done with the quick review uh, with screenshots if we need to an explanation of what is wrong. So we don't need any documents from the client, but that's going to come during the cleanup. Um, what we need to do the quick review is just either access to QuickBooks Online or if they're still on desktop, I'll bid them on desktop. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Bye. yeah. All right, um, and then um, another uh, question was um, somebody just starting out, um, they hear a lot about firing clients but are asking specifically for suggestions on um, looking for hiring the right kind of clients. So when you, I'm, I don't have any problem when you first start out by taking all the work that comes to you. Um, I didn't, when I started, I didn't say no. And being honest and telling clients, you know what, I this is going to be my my first gig, like my first. This is not my jam. This is going to be the first time I'm doing a gig like this. Most of the time, when you're honest like that, clients are going to be okay with it. If you say, hey, we can work through this together, um, explain that. I just they, they everybody started out someplace, and taking on every client. Unless you already know what your specific, like what your jam is, and you know this is what I want to do, it helps you learn the types, of, it, it will help you find the industry or the niche that you want to work with. It will also help you identify the types, the personality of the clients that you want to work with. So I would say kind of take on, on everything. And then as far as, you'll, your, your gut is going to know. One of the things that I tell people about, how do you know when it's time to fire a client? It's when you get that twisty, icky feeling in your stomach, when you get a text or an email or a phone call, when you start getting that dreaded, like, ugh, feeling, it's time for that client Probably to go. Probably one minute to go. Yeah, right? it's time for that client to go. So I, I, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, I I no, and then um, just one more quick follow-up to the quick review. If they're not running QuickBooks yet, is there... So there's no point in doing a quick review because okay, so um, we're going to bring, uh, I don't, we're going to take the data that they have and we're going to put it into QuickBooks in a meaningful way. So there's not really a, the point, that's kind of the third reason somebody call, comes to us is because they don't have, they're not using QuickBooks. So there's not really any need for a quick review there. It's just, you know, getting the information that we need to start uh, an accounting system and, a, and a, that's it. I That's where that sentence ends. Somebody sent <laughs> in a comment and it makes my heart happy. Thank you and thank you to you guys. Can we take a vote and let to stay here another hour and continue the session? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, whoever said yes. that. That's anonymous. Um, yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, oh, it's Saks okay. Fifth Avenue for whoever is asking about shoes. <laughs> Thank you as well for that compliment. Um, so it's a compliment and not of where to avoid shoe shopping. Yeah, <laughs> they did say gold, so I don't know. Um, okay, uh, last question. Um, Ingrid, I love the fact that you talked about how when you weeded the garden, it allowed you to focus on a niche. We haven't talked niche today, but niches, you're hearing it all throughout the conference. Final three minutes, so keep it quick. But how did that and it open up the niche door for you? Yeah, as we were reviewing our clients, we really started to see which ones we didn't want to work with, which ones we did want to work with. And it was amazing how many of those were separated out by industry. So we've learned we don't want to work with nonprofits and dumb reports. We don't want to work with construction or restaurants or retail or even um, online marketing anymore. It just, those aren't our jam, as Casey would say. And as I was looking through the clients that we did really enjoy working with, a couple really rose to the top, and we decided that we wanted to focus on, get this, cultural and adventure tour companies. I don't know why. What is that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that could be local biker wine tours, river rafting, or hey, let's go on safari in a far off land. We love adventurous spirits who love what they do, enjoy connecting with other people, aren't allergic to technology, and they're always eager to learn new things. And we were looking for an industry that would pretty much always embody those traits. And one thing that we do in our onboarding process before we even start the discovery process is that we have a new client questionnaire, which is also available if anybody wants to check it out on our website, where 
people who want to come work with us fill out the questionnaire before we ever meet them. That is the first thing. So we get the answers that we need to some important questions to triage out the ones that we know aren't going to be a fit so that we can direct them to Hector and Stacy and Michelle right away and save everybody time and money because that's a big part of what it's all about. There is no such thing as competition, particularly among the people in this room. Competition is a limiting belief. And I know for us, especially as educators, you know, Stacy's got the Stacy K Academy. We've got the Polymath Accountant Bootcamp, which you can check out at polymath.com forward slash accountant education. <laughs> Hector and Michelle have the QD Power Hour. We're all working to create a rising tide that raises all ships. Why would any one of us take on a client that isn't going to be our ideal client when we can refer that client to you because it might be your ideal client. There is no such thing as competition. How can we work together? It's not a limited amount of pie that we're trying to elbow out and you know get our slice of pie. If we want more pie, let's get together and make some pie. And, and I just want to add on that. This conference is a wonderful, wonderful place. They say connect for a reason. Because like she said, when you specialize, whether it's in an industry or I chose to specialize in QuickBooks Consulting and Training, then you can develop relationships with others and have mutually beneficial referral relationships. You know, if I don't want to do something, I can refer them to Hector. He might refer something to me. I didn't want to do taxes. I could refer that to people who love to do taxes. Let them do that. I can clean up the QuickBooks file, set up the client, do the training, whatever. So this is your opportunity. Connect with one another. Start making relationships with one another. I know people who specialize in point of sale or in fishbowl inventory or in method or in T-sheets, whatever it might be, so that I have people who can help meet the needs of the clients. So this is a great opportunity. I encourage you, don't sit and talk to the people you always sit and talk to. Go sit at a different table. Get to know different people. Try to meet different people here. This is a great opportunity for that. And I hope you guys will take that to heart and start making some connections and, and take that home with you. So, um, two years ago, I thought niche was about industry. And somebody asked me, Hector, what's your niche? And I froze. And I usually don't freeze. I usually have an answer for everything. And I realized I don't have an industry with niche, but I do have a niche. I have a niche on how I work with clients. Yeah. So don't think of niche as industry only. Okay. Niche is also how you work, when you work, how you price, how you price, niche how is your you work. Niche is your process. Niche is not industry. That. So don't get stuck on that piece. It's just yeah. a learning that I had last year. And everyone's going to start somewhere with it. It doesn't have to be, oh, this is my favorite industry. I'm going to go there. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys. Yeah. them to pay us before we do this process. If they balk or they fight or they complain about paying us that before we... Did you want to get that? <laughs> 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 I wanted this out with that.